evening, Dr. Uh, Rajesh Shah. Uh, good evening, our President, Dr. Gopalakrishna, General Secretary, Dr. Durga Prasad, uh, Treasurer, Dr. Uh, uh, Venugopal Gauri, good evening to all our vice presidents, executive members, and the office bearers, and uh, also all the viewers. Good evening to Dr. Arun Basmeji, uh, the former president of the Central Council of Homeopathy. I welcome you. So, uh, since uh, last uh, one year, we are uh, organizing a series of uh, uh, webinars on COVID 19 itself right from the last year. So uh, we brought you what is going on world over in the field of the COVID-19. Uh, the medicines evolved in its uh, prevention, in its uh, uh, clinical treatment. We also brought you uh, various uh, stages of the pathogenesis of the COVID-19, its uh, relation to its pathogenesis, the investigations required at various stages, and also its relation to our uh, uh, various stages related to our uh, biosematic theory, theory and uh, the medicines evolved uh, for uh, various stages uh, we brought you. Now, uh, in this, during this year, just last month only, so we organized a webinar about our uh, past experiences and the present strategies required. Now, we are uh, bringing you the COVID-19 no sword and the future research of opportunities uh, by Dr. Rajesh Shah. So we have different, uh, uh, I mean, uh, we, we are interested, we are sincerely interested in uh, catering the needs of uh, our various viewers. So some of our viewers are uh, interested in uh, updating their knowledge for the prevention and also for the treatment of the COVID-19. Some of our viewers are also interested in their uh, research activities. So to update them in uh, the test, whatever they are having, we are uh, sincerely bringing uh, uh, what is going on in the field of the uh, COVID-19 in homeopathy, we are uh, bringing you. May I request our uh, President Dr. Gopala Krishnagaru to welcome uh, the speaker and also the, our uh, uh, viewers. Thank you, Dr. Gopala Krishna. Please uh, continue. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. I feel honored to welcome you all to this webinar, topic being COVID-19 no sold future research opportunities by a very eminent doctor, Dr. Rajesh Shah. He's a great physician, a great researcher, and also a popular teacher. And we are very glad to invite you, sir. We heard you two years ago in our association premises. So we once again heartily welcome you, sir. I welcome all the audience, participants, delegates, and our past president, Dr. Sampat Rao, our treasurer, Dr. Venugopal Gauri, and our general secretary, Dr. Durga Prasad Rao. And I also acknowledge the presence of Dr. Arun Basri, former president CCH. Namaskar, sir. Please unmute yourself. Dr. Krishna, unmute yourself. Yeah. So, uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. Great. So, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Uh, I must thank uh, Telangana Homeopathic Medical Association for inviting me over, uh, especially Dr. Sampat Raoji, Dr. Gopal Krishna, Dr. Durga Prasad Ji, Dr. Venu Gopal. Uh, thank you so much for having me again. I was with you in Telangana some couple of years back, and I have great memories of that. 
and i also i'm happy to see lot of senior homeopaths here in the group dr arun basme ji my friend dr jayesh uh, sangvi and many other senior homeopaths i i convey my greetings to everyone and uh, i would like to share some of my experiences and thoughts on this uh, topic or subject very close Rajesh sir, you have to unmute your mic, please. Rajesh sir, sir, you are uh, not audible. Oh, okay. Right, Am I audible? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. You uh, are now. So should I start from again? Because I think I thought I was audible. So we I, could hear you, sir. Oh, just a few seconds we lost. That's okay. So uh, um, you know, I'm just conveying my greetings to all of you. and uh, as i said i've been working on this uh, covid 19 nozzle for last over one year is this a and second you are not audible sir muting uh, me because i i'm on two two okay i don't know why i think when it is unmuted Okay. Now you should be muted, sir, because you have been made the co-host. Yes, please. Thank you. So, uh, as I said, I decided to come out of the lab now, and I I thought that I must share my experiences with the fellow homeopaths, my colleagues, and the entire homeopathic profession. So I started talking on that since a few days, and uh, so uh, let us talk about this COVID nozzle. Uh, we all know that nozzles are very powerful homeopathic medicines which have been in use since uh, uh, since the time homeopathy started uh, dr samuel hennyman was the first to introduce the first nozzle that was uh, sorinum uh, way back in uh, 1826 27 after which uh, many of the nozzles came all of you know about that there are some very interesting things about nozzles that you know uh, uh, robert cock for example Uh, identified the mycobacterium tuberculosis organisms somewhere in 1882 but very interestingly there was a homeopathic nozzle the tuberculinum and bacillinum which was prepared 7 to 8 years prior to robert cock finding the organism that was in 1875 similarly uh, uh, constantine herring developed uh, a nozzle lysin you know that is hydrophobinum from rabies the virus and the the anti rabies vaccine came in 1885 that was 50 almost 50 years after the homeopathic nozzle lysin was introduced so in that sense uh, homeopathy has remained uh, quite advanced in the very very early part of the micro microbiology development however having said that in last 100 years no much research went into homeopathic nozzles and as a result homeopathy remained quite behind and uh, you know and uh, we could not you know explore the, the benefits of home benefits of nozzles to an extent that we need to <coughs> see as i look at the nozzles and vaccines of course they both are different but both of them are based on the same principle but both of and at the same time both of them have Uh, inherent capacity to trigger the immune response in certain way you see so i look at nozzles and vaccines uh, uh, in a in a way that there are two different ways of stimulating the human immune system and uh, this these ways are different homeopathically as we know with the potentization we we accentuate the efficacy of the uh, you know viral material and still making it safe yet powerful enough to stimulate the vitality and in in vaccine there is a different way of doing it so we 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 need to do substantial work now in the nozod research and uh, you know that can really take homeopathy to the next level and i am fully convinced because i have been working on developing and researching on nozods for last uh, almost 24 25 years and he also developed uh, almost 12 12 different nozzles very scientifically systematically with the help of various scientist friends 
you know, virologist, immunologist, pharmacologist, and so on in uh, very reputed laboratories. So we understood the subject well. And when this Corona came somewhere in February last year, and immediately I started thinking about developing the nosode because that was that was the echoing of many homeopaths across the world because most of us thought of having some nosode as a possibility which could potentially help us in the prevention and as well as possibly for the treatment. So I will take you through a brief through the journey very briefly. Uh, if you can change the slide, please. Yeah. So we developed the three uh, nosodes very very systematically. There are three variants. The first variant was prepared from clinical sample um, uh, at Hafkin Institute, Mumbai. Hafkin Institute is one which is uh, which also makes BCG vaccine and measles vaccine for the entire country. It is 125 years old, dormant virology institution, very famous of one of its type. Uh, then we also had two more variants or two more types of nosores, one from inactivated strain of the virus and the third one was prepared from spike glycoprotein. So as we have got different vaccines, as you know, from different uh, viral materials, we, similarly, we also developed these nosores uh, from different viral materials. I'm happy to share that these three nozores were prepared a few months prior to the uh, COVID-19 vaccine which came in the market. So that way we were little uh, well in time, I would say, uh, in developing the nozores in homeopathy. And this was the world's first ever COVID-19 nozore ever made. And that came, to, that came from India. So we should, I think, always take a little pride in that. Next, please. So these are the two institutions uh, that is Hafkin Institute and Gujarat University, uh, as I said earlier, with the help of many experts, we used the BSL-2 plus facility in making of the nosework. Now, there are certain technical information that I believe that every homeopath must know. We homeopaths are clinicians and we often think that we don't need to really worry about the research part of it, the laboratory part of it, but that is not true. We need to really understand how the medicines are developed, what are the intricacies involved, what are the formalities, what are the protocols, what are the, what are the methods behind developing the nosodes or any medicine for that matter, what are the regulatory, what is the regulatory framework. We all, we need to know that in the current time, we just can, we homeopaths cannot simply, you know, take um, the medicines uh, for granted just from the label that we read on the, on the bottle. We need to go into the detail of the source materials. So this nozod was developed at B, using BSL-2 plus facility that is called Biosafety Level 2. These are the laboratories required to handle any biological material. These nozodes cannot be prepared just like that in the clinic. Let us understand that. It is not that you take the uh, patient's sputum or patient's uh, mucus or patient's saliva who is infected with COVID, put it in alcohol, give some strokes and prepare the medicine. That is not the way Nozot could be made in today's time. Maybe 150 years back, the microbiology was not evolved. So that the method was different. But now we need to really do a lot of uh, scientific work in order to develop the nozot. So these all processes and methods were followed in the development of this uh, COVID-19 nozot. Next, please. <clears throat> so as I said, BSL-2 plus facility uh, was utilized. It requires permissions. There is a, uh, what is called as BSL-3 practice protocols. So this laboratory pro has BSL-2 plus facility, but it, it practices BSL-3 modalities. It is biosafety level 3 modalities. And the nozor was prepared as per uh, HPI guidelines, or HPI standards, that is Homeopathy Pharmacopoeia of India guidelines. And it was developed, as I said, at Hafkin Institute. And this was the scientifically developed nozor. There is a research paper on that. And those who are interested in going into the detail can just Google it up. There's a full article published in a peer reviewed journal where you can read the every detail of this nozo. <coughs> okay. Next, please. Now, after having developed the nozo, what next? We cannot start using the nozo just like that. That time is gone. When you prepare any medicine from the biological material, that also from a very dangerous and risky organisms like coronavirus, 
sars cov 2 virus the the utmost important aspect is the safety of this nozzle when we use this nozzle we homeopaths possibly believe that every nozzle when used in the potency beyond say 10 or 12 is safe however that is our belief the regulatory authorities the government the other scientists obviously will not accept the idea that every nozzle or every homeopathic medicine prepared from metals or toxins or venoms are safe for human use they require to undergo certain safety studies so we did animal toxicity study toxicity study uh, on two species by following what is called as oecd guidelines this was possibly the first of its kind nozzle ever studied with oecd guidelines in the world uh, with the practice of glp guidelines and animal ethics committee approval with that we conduct we st studied the nozzle with acute and subacute toxicity in animals in on these two species and we found that this nozzle was safe in animals there was one of the first steps besides that the product was also safe because the product was tested for rt pcr to see whether it has any viral material in the 30c potency which is finally going to be used and we found that after 5c potency of the nozzle there was no viral material so the so the or it did not have of course microbial growth <coughs> so that proved that the nozzle is safe for use next please but that again is not enough we had to see that this nozzle has safety in human model so we conducted what is called as a phase 1 study where healthy volunteers were prescribed were uh, administered the nozzle in certain doses also the icp gcp guidelines by due after due ethical approvals and ctri registry as per the icri regulations following all the guidelines prescribed by the government of india and by the ministry of ayush we we conducted the phase 1 study in humans and found a uh, very interesting thing only that we found that the covid-19 nozzle was safe for human use but we also found next we also found that there were very interesting biomarkers which were observed to be elevated in the human study next please so of course and about the uh, i think before i talk about the biomarkers there was one more thing which was done simultaneously that was drug proving on 10 healthy volunteers using uh, ethical approval process ctri and so on uh, because drug proving of a medicine is required as per drug and cosmetic act and uh, uh, so that was also studied and we found that nobody got infected after taking the nozzle next is yeah so after that we wanted to now examine this nozzle on humans so we conducted a, a, a medium size reasonably large size the human trial which we called as phase 2 trial with this nozzle in a quarantine facility which was run by the local yes, mumbai bombay municipal corporation so the bmc had several quarantine facilities in mumbai which was housing the people who were exposed to covid patients in their family or in the surrounding so these people were There were around two thousand two hundred and thirty-three people who participated participate in the study. It was a randomized placebo-controlled trial on high-risk COVID-19 exposed people, as per the standard ethical guidelines and CTRI registry. It was a multi-arm study. This was possibly the only study where uh, uh, we compared the efficacy of the nozzle uh, against uh, arsenic, bryonia. Uh, placebo camphor and a combination of arsenic bryonia gelsenium and influenza influenza so this was a multi arm comparative study where, where we could see next please we, we could see very interesting out, outcome of in this study we found that the the covid nozzle had shown 62% more prevention than placebo so this was a very encouraging result for us in, on a human trial So it could really prevent the infection up to 62 percent versus placebo. Not only that, but those people who got infected uh, had much milder and shorter course of the disease, because this is what is expected from any prophylactic uh, tool or measure, right? Even with the vaccine, what we are looking for is the 
first of all, the disease should be prevented. Or even if one gets infected, even after the vaccine, the disease should run a milder course. The disease should not be complicated. The disease should not require uh, to go into, you know, should not go for ventilation and hospitalization. So this is this is what is expected from from any prophylactic measure. That is exactly what we achieved. And this was also, I must say, that this was the world's first COVID-19 nozzled randomized placebo control study. So with that, and then we had one more interesting finding. Next, please. In some of the volunteers, OK, yeah, this shows the graph of the efficacy of COVID nozzled versus bryonia, arsenic, camphor, and the combination medicine and placebo. We found that nozzled and bryonia and arsenic they produced very good results. Of course, however, camphor did not produce any good result at all. The, the efficacy with camphor in the prevention was as good as placebo. And of course, the combination medicine also did not produce very good results, but it was much better than camphor. And the best results were achieved from nozod and bryonia. The bryonia also did extremely good compared to study. Next one. See, as, a, as a researcher uh, and who is working on the scientific aspects of uh, the nozod, nozod research, my focus was always on understanding the mechanism of action of the homeopathic medicines because that is exactly where we have been missing out for ages because we have never understood how homeopathic medicines work. We all know in our practice every single day that our medicines prescribed for various patients, they bring uh, you know, superb results. However, the mechanism of action of medicines is little understood. So in this study of in phase one trial, we observed some very interesting uh, leads. What we found was that 90% of the volunteers in the phase one trial, they had uh, an increase in IL-6 cytokine. And that is an immunomarker. With that, out of that 70% of the volunteers who had an increase, they also had increased in CD4 count. Now, the CD4 cells, as you know, are the fighter cells, they're lymphocytes. And this put together is a sign of activation of uh, T cell activation. So, so what we could observe was that there was a definite immune response in the, in the volunteers who consumed the nozole. And this was suggestive of T cell activation. Now, this is exactly what is required when we talk to the scientists and to the scientific world. We need to explain to them or show them how homeopathic medicines work. So the COVID nozod in our preliminary findings, these are all preliminary findings, okay? And there we have been able to show not only its safety, but it is its efficacy as well as its mode of uh, uh, action. So this was a good uh, understanding for us that the COVID nozod could uh, produce an effect suggestive of T cell activation. So with this, we realized that this medicine could be of uh, benefit to the humankind. Next please. So then we also used the nozod in uh, an experimental manner. We are not sharing this nozod with the outside world. We are not, of course, selling the nozods. I am not a manufacturer. I am not a pharma, so we don't sell the, the nozod, but we give it, we have used this on you know, experimentally on some of the patients because the cases have been extremely high in the city of Mumbai, as you all know. And we could, we, we could find that in number of patients, number of families, number of people who were given the nozod and those who were also exposed to the infection, the nozod could prevent the infection in many people, if not in all. Of course, I am nowhere claiming that this nozod has the capacity to make 100% prevention. That is not what is expected. But it could definitely prevent the infection in number of high-risk individuals. To give you an example, you know, we had patients uh, uh, in the family, maybe six or eight people infected in the family. And one or two persons who had taken the nozod, who stayed in the same family for the entire duration, they did not get the infection. Likewise, we have got a number of examples. We also have that some people who even got the infection in spite of taking the nozod, they ran a symptomatic phase. They did not develop any symptoms. 
we observed some of the people who had consumed the nozod they had very mild symptoms with very little no i mean mild to moderate without having any severe symptoms and most of these people they recovered much faster uh, you know some of the people turn negative in, in uh, seven to nine days or even shorter time than that so this is this was enough uh, uh, initial lead for us to consider this medicine to be used by the profession so with all this data we we have a huge data based on this research which is almost a 600 page uh, document and uh, next is so so uh, you know with, with with this understanding let us understand what could be the scope of the dozod in practice so as we all know the most important uh, the scope is on today of this dozod is the prophylactic use this dozod has a potential of uh, preventing the infection as on today in fact when we started there was no vaccine and that time we were almost helpless of course arsenic oil was one of the medicines and bryonia which was preventing the disease in many people but we did not have scientific studies so this was one medicine which, which was developed when there was no no even vaccine and even after vaccine vaccine as we all know is uh, very effective but it is not 100% the success rate in vaccine uh, has certain limitations and we also know that even after developing the vaccine even after taking the vaccines many people are getting infection and even deaths are also happening so besides the prophylactic role this medicine has a potential therapeutic role we have also used experimentally on some of the people known to us therapeutically so those people who got infected and had chance to take the nozod on day 1 or 2 in the very early stage they ran very mild course some of them had asymptomatic uh, picture all throughout the course of the disease so another possibility with the you know, the benefit of this nozod could be the use in post covid 19 uh, symptomatology as you know nowadays there are we have cases of long covid some patients come to us with uh, after effects of covid which include uh, you know various muscle pain or myalgia weakness loss of appetite uh, even pulmonary fibrosis so of course we need to make some further studies specifically to see post covid complications and the nozod it's a separate study by itself that we need to do but i have a feeling that in controlling and uh, improving uh, some of the complications such as uh, pulmonary fibrosis i think this nozod may have some potential and it may have some other uses other than the covid infection itself based on the symptomatology based on the drug proving symptoms possibly you can use this nozod uh in uh, maybe uh, some kind of arthritic uh, pathologies maybe in rheumatoid arthritis and so on so th this is in brief about the the scope of the dozod yeah next please so now uh, a million dollar question everybody is asking me wherever i go or, or otherwise in the social media uh, by phone by emails on chats on facebook etc that when will the covid dozod be made available and uh, i i am not still in position to share the nozod with anybody and that is uh, that's a very sad feeling for me also because i sometimes i give an you know a kind of analogy i say that i feel like like a mother who has cooked the food good food which is made available in the kitchen and the mother has many kids who are hungry and in need of food but the mother is not able to serve the food to to her kids so imagine that kind of situation that is the kind of mind uh, mind you know there's a kind of feeling that i have at this point because the nozod is ready to use with potential i am not claiming the cure with that but there is a huge potential and there's a need for this nozod in the world and more so in india but still we are not able to formally officially and legally distribute the nozod and use the nozod to prevent the disease and also to treat the disease and why is it so next is because that is what that is what i want you all to know that in order that the nozod is made available to the world there are some regulations in place the nozod covid nozod is a new homeopathic drug okay and for new homeopathic drug you cannot simply make and prepare and sell it or give it you require to have government approval so there is a regulatory body 
India is one of the countries in which new drugs are uh, well controlled, which is very good, of course. They are controlled by the government for the quality reasons and for the safety reasons. And uh, without the regulation, one cannot manufacture the drug. But the problem in India is, all the homeopaths, please listen to me carefully. The problem in India or as on today is that we do not have clear cut regulations for approving the new homeopathic drugs or nozor. I repeat, we do not have rules in place to approve new homeopathic nozors or new homeopathic drugs. This is a problem because as a result, new drug discovery is not happening in India. And without these rules and regulations for new drugs in place, we cannot bring the nozors to the world. Now, the good thing is that as per the Ayush ministry notifications dated as shown on the screen, 21st April and 28th July, if any COVID research is done as per the notifications, then there is a provision. There is a provision that the Ministry of Ayush could uh, make the approval process for this drug. There is a provision. So with this understanding, next please. We have documented, we have submitted our entire document of research on this COVID nozor to the government of India as well as to the Ministry of Ayush and to the Prime Minister's office. We have made an appeal to the government almost three months ago. So my entire document, which is three and a half kilograms in weight and 600 pages, this is lying on the tables of the ministry. And the good thing is that the ministry is definitely reviewing it. There are a couple of rounds of review which have happened, but the process is going very, very slow. We do not have that kind of luxury of time that, you know, such approvals are done leisurely. So our require, our need and our appeal and our request to the ministry and to the government of India is to get an emergency approval for the NOSO based on the studies that we have done. Of course, research is an ongoing thing. We will continue doing further research. Uh, I must also share with you that we have initiated a phase three trial with this COVID-19 NOSO. And but that will go on. You see, the vaccines also had emergency approval. Some of the studies which are required for, for the marketing of the vaccine were, were not done because we did not have that kind of time, obviously. So with those limitations, the vaccines have been put to the market. Similarly, the homeopathic nozod also must get and it deserves an emergency approval. So our request is in place with the ministry. And I would, all those people who are here, some of you, with the ministry and some of the different levels with the council and institutions. I would like all the homeopaths, all the homeopathic institutions, homeopathic colleges, homeopathic pharma to put hands together and submit a request to the government saying that this nozod must be given an emergency review and approval. So that is my humble request to all of you because we all will have to put, join hands together. This emergency approval Nozod of the Nozod is not one person's job. With God's grace, we could somehow develop the Nozod in spite of all the difficulties and hurdles during the lockdown period in the city of Mumbai. We could do that successfully. We could develop the COVID Nozod, first of its kind in the entire world in India. However, now for the government approval and other formalities, we require the support from the profession. And I'm sure all of you will get sensitized about it. Yeah, next please. So, uh, let us talk a little bit about what could possibly happen if uh, the code is approved. And uh, if we, I think some people can uh, mute their mobile. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you. So what can happen if the nozod is approved and uh, it is used for the masses? I have my uh, thoughts very clear in, you know, in my mind that the efficacy was what the nozod has shown so far. If we can get the similar or higher efficacy with the nozod by mass usage in, in the country, then that can be a great game changer for the entire science of homeopathy. Because 
whatever difficulties we are facing as a as a science as a profession about the limitations of homeopathy about the inefficacy of homeopathy about the lack of science behind homeopathy and so on that all will be can be addressed very well and there can be immediate surge in the acceptance of the system of homeopathy not only that and more important than that for me is that once the nozor shows more scientific uh, efficacy in various studies because further research is already on in in our uh, with our by our teams once we have more and more research and once we are able to demonstrate for example further uh, molecular pathways how the nozor is working and then if, if that thing was then suddenly the entire scientist world scientist in the world the entire fraternity of the scientists will suddenly start looking at homeopathy uh, as a possibility to uh, conduct more scientific studies so we can have a pool of many scientists from mainstream who can suddenly uh, take up the research in homeopathy and that is exactly what is my dream at the end of the day what i want personally is that there should be at least 5000 scientists from the mainstream they should work on not only the nozor but the on homeopathy on the drug discovery in homeopathy about understanding the molecular uh, pathways of the efficacy and a lot more so suddenly there is a huge possibility that the science and the practice of homeopathy can make a huge change it can there can be a big face lift these are the ideas that i have in my mind that's why i call it possibly uh omevati in a covid 19 nozod can become instrumental in changing the game next is <coughs> so uh just to give you certain highlights of uh, this nozod uh just to recap uh, of course this nozod has been prepared scientifically it has got proven immunity uh, building capacity observed in the in in the human trials the nozod is safe safety is very important for any new drug especially uh, you know vaccine like preparation like nozod now in my several post and articles i have i have used the word say i, I was personally hesitant in uh, calling nozod uh, a vaccine because nozod is not a vaccine obviously and i was not even very comfortable comparing nozod and vaccine because i thought they are two different things as most of you also will believe the same but then after understanding little bit more about the vaccine and the immunology uh, i understood that what is a vaccine vaccine is nothing but a medicinal substance capable of inducing immune response to prevent the disease that is a vaccine okay vaccine is nothing to do with whether it is injectable or not injectable vaccine has nothing to do whether it is inactivated by weakening the virus through some attenuation process used in vaccination or whether it is potentized that is not the that is not the definition of a vaccine the vaccine definition is that any medicinal substance which has an inherent capacity to uh, provoke or to induce or to trigger immune response so that particular disease is getting uh, in a particular disease is prevented now with that understanding of a vaccine with the nozod or any homeopathic medicine in the particular with the nozod with the nozod with the nozod can do a similar job of preventing a prophylactic capacity by uh, stimulating the immune response then possibly a homeopathic nozod could be considered a vaccine so please understand my perspective some people do not like the idea if i compare the two but anyway one should think little more i am saying there are comparable or they they can be explored in in this in the same basket uh, i also personally believe in which i must share here with with all of you that <coughs> vaccine and nozodes are two different ways of activating the stimulity uh, activating the the immunity in the body uh, one method is attenuation that is what is followed by the method of vaccination and there's another method which is simple yet sophisticated and that is potentization so potentize potentization in my view is one of the ways how we can possibly 
develop vaccine like preparations like nozols in future so this is of course futuristic but uh, if we work in this direction for many more years with the help of many mainstream scientists then possibly we can uh, we can look forward to something very interesting for the science this is what my personal belief is next is after the safety we could see that the nozol has shown efficacy in the preclinical and clinical uh, model one of the important aspects of nozol which we must know is that this nozol is an oral drug unlike the most of the vaccines this is a oral medicine and this oral medicine is used at a room temperature earlier we did not understand the importance of that but then any vaccine like preparation if it is given orally like oral polio for example polio vaccine or if it is made available at a room temperature then there are many less hassles because one of the challenges with the vaccine today is that it requires certain temperature cold storage right so, so distribution also is a big challenge so these are the advantages of homeopathic nozol of course the, the, it is a low cost uh, solution the vaccines are typically very expensive when available commercially in the market as you know another beauty with the nozols if it comes in the market or uh, is approved is that this can be manufactured very rapidly there can be fast manufacturing as on today the vaccine is facing a big challenge of manufacturing there is no enough manufacturing or availability of this nozol i mean see this vaccine right but then there are ways how we have thought of whereby homeopathic nozol can be manufactured very fast and even if you want to give a nozol to over 1.4 billion people in the country and in the world then within 3 to 6 months possibly uh, there is a way to you know manufacture and distribute this nozol to possibly the entire country and the entire world <coughs> and not to forget that this nozol is made in india it's a made in india product so there are many things uh, in favor of the nozol next please so uh, uh, see all this research work which was done by the life force foundation trust which was a charitable trust but now in order that we do further studies which are you know very uh, resource consuming uh, time consuming and it requires lot of uh, funding and all so we have started what is called as a spv a special purpose vehicle a small entity called biosimilia which is a very significant name biosimilia means it's a different uh, word for nozol a sophisticated word bio is bio similia is something which is based on law of similars so that's how we have coined this word and we started one small group which is called biosimilia and the which we intend to do further research activities and the you know other regulatory processes so i am sure at the end of this talk there will be uh, questions that we will answer some questions we may not be able to answer this is my mobile number feel free to write down this mobile number if you have some questions which could not be answered during this talk i'll be free to give my thoughts um, and and a part of several whatsapp groups where i am happy to discuss uh, various aspects of uh, nozol development in the research so you can do that uh, next please so i think we, with this uh, a small disclaimer nowhere in the in my talk i am claiming that the homeopathic nozol covid 19 is a substitute to vaccine no vaccines are great vaccines are not enough maybe in in my personal view i believe that what we need today in the world is the combination of nozol and the vaccine or vaccine and nozol together because that can possibly give us bigger protection so nozol is not a substitute nozol is not to be taken instead of vaccine i can i don't see that uh, all the safety measures are to be taken care of uh, you know in spite of taking a nozol it is not that you take a nozol and then you stop using the mask and stop practicing social distancing of course not you no claim is made for the complete prevention or complete cure after using the nozol and of course we need to do lot of lot more research this is not this is the beginning of what you have done you have conducted so far more of a pre clinical and some clinical trials but we need to conduct many more studies i think it's a lifelong thing so covid nozol research will go on in my personal life for at least next 3 uh, to 5 years even if the pandemic will get over but the nozol will always remain isn't it is the all the nozols like variolinum nozol has remained even after the smallpox disappeared 
you know rabies is very little but the the lysin nozod is still with us likewise covid nozod will have long term implications and the benefits also once we have this nozod in place that could be used even after the virus uh, says goodbye to us so a lot of research is required of course in this field yeah next please so with that i think uh, i would like to conclude my talk today and i would like to thank everybody for listening to me uh, patiently and uh, uh, i think we'll take some questions uh, through the help of a moderator uh, so please uh, send your questions to the chat i believe and uh, our moderator will put these questions before me and i'll try to answer as much as i can thank you so much for listening to me thank you dr rajesh shah i was looking into the chat box and uh, there are a few questions uh, number one is uh, uh, itri permission was it take question number one and question number two is il6 uh, cytokines and cd4 count were, all, were also uh, carried out in the case of the arsenic bryonia and the camphor and uh, third one is uh, phase 2 and phase uh, what is the difference between the phase 2 and phase 3 and uh, phase 3 trials uh, how far they are progressing so these are the three questions our viewers are putting uh yeah so i'll i'll answer them one by one uh the il6 and cd4 count that was a part of the phase 1 study so that study was conducted with uh, 10 healthy volunteers and there we observed this uh, elevation of the biomarkers the biomarker which uh, increased uh, several folds like for example il6 normal limit is 0 to i guess 0.6 but then with the with the dose of uh, nozod it increased several folds so it increased to 12 14 i think up to 36 45 this is what i remember is there on the document now when the il6 increased it is a pro inflammatory cytokine as you all know is apparently it gives a feeling that oh it has produced some kind of inflammation in the body but then we had a uh, on our uh, team we have some very eminent immunologists on the board and we had uh, very detailed discussions and you know communication with them which i must share partly that with the increase of il6 if there is an increase of crp c react to protein then that is a sign of inflammation but if there is no crp which is increased it means then this is not inflammation but this is the immunological response so it was the immune response so this was favorable immune response uh, to the nozod uh, this study was not done with arsenic and bryonia because that was arsenic bryonia was a uh, was a human trial it was another trial so we had th three trials one was the phase 1 on 10 individuals then there was a phase 2 which was on 2233 individuals in which uh, the objective was only not to study the biomarkers it was not possible to do it on 2000 plus people because this is extremely expensive and very very sensitive test and uh, that was only to see the prevention now the phase 3 trial is your third patient that trial is begun now and that is going to be in two parts so the the complete size uh, phase uh, three number will be 3000 people and uh, this will be a multi location study so we have uh, four sites for this to start with in the first phase we will study the preventive role with the biomarkers on 200 individuals and in the next part we will have 2800 people so in fact uh, some of the institutions uh, heard if they are here then i'll be in the in the next phase we are going to invite some institutions to be uh, the invest to you know to, to be a investigating site so that we can talk separately on another day so this is a very interesting in fact this studies are done when in your institution this can create good experience for your faculty as well as for the students yeah i also said uh, one more question so you have taken uh, two species and i think there are uh, a uh, few more uh, varieties are there so this uh, two varieties you made only one was uh, out of them or uh, you take uh, you made uh, separately and uh, this immunity uh, how long it is going to be 
last. That means the duration of the action of the, I mean, this medicine. Yeah. So this is uh, another question, please. Very good. See, these questions are both relevant and very interesting. The reason is that, and the reason why I'm smiling with these questions is that in the past, we never asked questions about which strains were used in the nozole. We never asked about what will be the length of effect of these, no these nozoles. We never asked the question that in the making of tuberculinum, which organism was used. You know, and now we are evolving and the question came so easily within a few minutes of talk from whosoever who asked the question, I must congratulate. That see, this is the way we have to ask questions. These are the questions that we must even ask for each and every nozole that we have. Isn't it? So coming back, uh, this nozole, we developed three nozoles, three varieties. The first was from uh, uh, the one, right, the strain which we had from China. So it was prepared only, this was prepared in the month of May last year. That time we did not have other mutants. We did not have other varieties. So it was prepared only from one particular organism. But now to answer your question, now we have initiated another project of uh, developing a nozole with multiple strains. So now we have got, uh, you know, the Indian strain, the double mutant, we have South, Af South African, possibly, I'm, I'm not sure whether we'll get it or not, but the British strain. So we will try to prepare a new variant of a nozole using the, the currently available strains. And that's how it is. So every nozole is not the same. All nozoles are different because based on the ingredient that it has, the source material that it has, isn't it? Now, some people are asking me that, oh, Rajesh, you are talking about nozot, but we are already using COVID nozot. It is available in the market. Some of my friends in Europe, they say, oh, it is available in the UK. It is available in the, in the US. It is available somewhere else. It is also available in India. So I, I wrote a message a few days back saying, every COVID nozot is not the same. Try to find out what is it prepared from? How was it prepared? What did it contain? What was the safety measure taken? What is the regulation, uh, you know, regulatory framework and so on. So these are the questions that we need to ask, not only for COVID nozot, but about other medicines also, our existing drugs, about existing nozots. Can I, can I give one small teaser here? The, the teaser yes. is that the tuberculitum nozot, which we all are using, Did you know that there is no way we can make the tuberculinum today? Did you know this? There are some pharma people, I'm sure, very senior pharma uh, faces are there in this group. But as on today, we cannot make a new tuberculinum, same as what we are using in the practice. Did we all know this? Because the tuberculinum, bovinum, or whatever that we are using in our practice was made by uh, Samuel Swan in 1875 from possibly a suspected a suspected case of tuberculosis. The sputum of that person was taken and it was potentized. So that source did not undergo any microbial study, obviously. If, if you recall my early part of the talk, this nozole was made eight years before the mycobacterium tuberculosis organisms were found. So that till that time when the nozole was made, nobody knew what are the organisms of, of that tuberculosis. So in those circumstances, the nozole was made from some, somebody's sputum. Okay, and that tuberculinum was prepared and then it was re-prepared and it was re-re-prepared and then it went on and on and on by using the back potencies from uh, some part of Europe. It went to the UK, then went to the US, Boric Tafel, it went again to Europe. Then it came to India. Then from India, it came to Kolkata. From there, it came to Mumbai. The process began to Chennai. It came to <laughs> Hyderabad. So these are the back potencies that we all have been using of what, what we call is tuberculinum. And it means we cannot remake that because we have no microbial knowledge or know-how uh, no, um, know about this, this, about sources. Now, same is true with practically each and every nozode that we are using. That's the reason I say there's a time for 
relooking at all the nozzles and and examining them in a in a very systematic scientific way for not only for the preparation but preparation plus you know the safety and their efficacy in various models that's the way if you do that and and i must also share here if you have two four five, two three minutes i think how much time five o'clock okay i must also share that we have developed a, a, a range of nozzles in this manner uh, from hiv virus from hepatitis c virus from plasmodia falciparum parasites from e coli bacteria from salmonella from klebsiella influenzinum uh, klebsiella pneumonia from candida uh, from hpv there is human papilloma virus from cancer tissues and so on all this have been developed in last uh, 15 years of time there are published papers for all these nozzles so you can read them on google and they all have been studied systematically and also they have been studied for their respective antimicrobial efficacy to just give you a small example e coli nozzle in the laboratory has shown anti e coli properties and likewise plasmodium falciparum nozzle that we developed at iit bombay some 4 years ago has shown anti malarial properties in the in the cell line model and likewise cancer nozzle hiv nozzle and so on so this anti microbial properties of the nozzles is now already proven in our studies so likewise we need to really work on uh, some of the old nozzles as you know some of the nozzles we cannot remake even because the material is not available we cannot make smallpox nozzle right variolinum cannot be made again and so on so this there's a different subject but then I, my purpose of talking to this group is just to trigger some more curiosity and more questions about about the nozzles their genesis their sources and the way how they should be made and developed and used in practice thank you we can take a couple of questions if there are uh thank you sir um uh, i request all of you please leave your uh, uh, email and uh, mobile number so that we can uh, uh give our information of regarding the future webinars may I request the viewers uh, a few questions uh, one by one please anybody is having the doubts so in questions please uh, sir can i ask uh, dr rajesh shah ji a question please sure. sir i was wondering whether uh, this whole virion was used for the for making the nose you said there were three types you have um, procured the uh, this thing and uh, done it the whole virion was used sir including including the gene and all that and the spike protein yeah the the first virion which was from the clinical sample was a whole virus so it contained uh, you know the entire viral material While the other variant had inactivated virus so that was also a complete virus but it was inactivated it was brought inactivated and the third variant was having only the glycoprotein the spike glycoprotein which is the which is having the maximum antigenicity so that is made so now uh, since you are asking i must say that actually these three nozzles are actually different so to say or different variants it is like saying three different vaccines so their efficacy also must be examined separately so we have uh, some studies going on uh, with the uh, spike glycoprotein uh, variant of the nozzle at gujarat university in the department of life science so that study is already going on and uh, ccrh the ministry of ayush also has uh, decided to participate in that study and uh, uh, they are reviewing the project for last 9 months i hope they'll do it uh, in a couple of months time now and so that is separate study that we already have initiated so likewise as i said as i said then of course we have to finally compare the results we have to see what works better but then in the current time we do not have a luxury to examine each of these three variants by conducting separate in, uh, independent uh, clinical trials because everything is time incentive right it takes times and efforts 
and funding. But then we, in my view, one prepared from the clinical sample has the whole virus. So that is supposed to be more efficacious in terms of uh, its, application, its application. But does that survive, sir, when we are making the no sword? Uh, before we make the dilution, of course, uh, does that survive? Because uh, is it like an uh, attenuated uh, uh, sample virus or uh, um, something like uh, which is uh, found totally in the inactivated co-vaccine uh, vac uh, vaccine, sir? So, so, yes, it is inactivated because the live virus we cannot handle. Uh, for handling the live virus and preparing the nozzle from actual live virus requires BSL-3 plus facility, BSL-3, not BSL-2. So there are only two or three uh, such BSL-3 in the country. I think Dr. Shukla is here. He will know it better. But then we cannot, we, we did not have permission. Even CCR did not have permission to use BSL-3 facility because it is controlled by ICMR. And of course, we had written to ICMR for permission, but of course, uh, we did not even hear anything from them. So uh, that kind of situations are different, but we do not need. I think if you look at the history of our nozzles, in the past, in homeopathy, uh, all the homeopathic nozzles were prepared from clinical samples. Yeah. Sir, and so, is, uh, uh, for example, now the uh, uh, wax, the nozzle has been made. Now we can say uh, we have made a nozzle, sir, but there is no clinical proving as far as or drug proving kind of a thing as far as this particular nozzle is concerned. Number one, number two. We, you have uh, very uh, nicely done the work with bryonia, gelsemium, and also the COVID uh, uh, nosode, and also arsenical. And won't the scientific community again come back and say this is this not producing any antibodies? And uh, uh, how to really again prove back to them that it's another homeopathic uh, formulation and how different it is from the problems that we are already having now? Yeah, so uh, to answer your last question first, doctor, uh, when you look at immunity, there are, there are a couple of ways how immunity could be triggered. So one of the ways the immunity is triggered by vaccine is by producing uh, uh, the antibodies. Okay. Now with the nozode, we examined if it produced antibodies. So we had some volunteers who developed antibodies after using the nozode, but the count was low. So we need a bigger study to see whether the antibodies are produced by the nozode. However, very interestingly, what the nozode could do was triggering possibly the B, uh, T cell activation. So when it produces a, a CD4 count, which increases in a two to three weeks time to the tune of 20 to 50%. So once you have increased the CD4 count, it is T cell activation and that gives you a broader immunity. So we also have some examples which uh, it is not scientifically correct for me to share, but I can share as a just as a clinician, not as a scientist. Is that some people, some volunteers who had taken the nozole, and they said that some people in my family they developed cold like flu-like symptoms, you know, but he did not get it. Now this is typical of what you expect when your CD4 count increases, when you already have protection of certain type, so you will not get certain basic infections. So in a way, it is good that if the nozode is able to produce uh, this kind of uh, broader, broad spectrum uh, immune cover, then it can protect you from other infections as well. That is exactly what the tuberculinum seems to be doing. We all know that when we, give, when we give tuberculinum to children, they don't get frequent infections, right? That is everybody's experience. So it must be doing some kind of immune response. It must be increasing certain uh, immune cells so that that is, that is protecting you. So now we have to move from uh, something vague like uh, increasing the energy or something. We have to come to uh, some immunological, immuno immunomodulatory language we have to speak. So, yeah. So that is what exactly the nozode is doing. Then, then you had a first part of the question that was about, uh, sorry, I, I, I missed that question. Uh, like uh, it is made, made that the whole virion was moved, uh, used, and the spike was used. Uh, that answer, yeah. So we have three different things. Yeah. Yes, yes. And uh, uh, sir, how easy or how difficult is it to procure this uh, a virus? 
Sir, you asked about the drug proving. Ah, you asked about drug proving. Yeah. So drug proving of the COVID nineteen mask. Yes. So if you saw my one of the slides in the beginning, we did conduct drug proving. Though it was not a placebo controlled drug proving, but we did conduct the drug proving, and the paper is already accepted. I think it should be published in about a couple of weeks' time, and it will be available on. You will find it on Google Scholar or something. Okay. So drug proving was done. However, just Uh, just to clarify for the use of nozod for prevention you do not require a drug proving drug proving will be required if we are using the nozod for uh, conditions other than the uh, the covid infection right for using as prevention you are going to give it blind date to everybody or whoever is willing to take it so you do not require the symptoms many people are confused getting confused about this they say first you do drug proving and then we'll use the nozod i said for using the nozod you do not require a drug proving because you are not going to prescribe the nozod for prevention based on anybody's symptoms and its uh, clinical use also is considered as one of the symptom yes yes of course clinical use uh, based on the uh, drug proving and other criteria can be used as a <coughs> indication Sir, this nozod was uh, used in 30 C potency, I believe. Yes. Yes. Do you find any any difference in the proving or uh, prevention part if it is used in a higher potency? Yeah. So this is a, a question. Uh, we would like to make a comparative study to give you a scientific answer to this. We are also considering studying it with uh, say lower potency, say 15 potency, as well as higher potency like 200 or 1000. But as you know every study requires every study is a separate study so suppose if i want to see whether 200 works better or 30 then i have to do one comparative study it requires same amount of double efforts rather so in our uh, clinical experience what uh, we think is uh, no sorts act very well in very high potencies yeah so uh, i will say here that once the nozod is approved and made available it will be made available in different potencies so individually every physician will have one's own uh, uh, method of prescribing so you can choose to use your potency of your choice what you are comfortable with there is no one standard potency for all so like for yeah. example some people might use medorinum 30 and some might use medorinum 10m that is your choice nothing is right and wrong in that i believe so is there any possibility to combine all the mutant variants uh, strains into one uh, covid strain or covid uh, vaccine or, or uh, no sort whatever we can tell it yes so yeah, is there any possibility to combine all these strains into one yes and because uh, uh, since 1965 there are lot of uh, mutations being done on, uh, mutations which have undergone by this corona virus so how yeah. much uh, possibility is there for the effectiveness even though if, if you want to use it as no sort uh, or prevent to part how much effective it will be there yeah so th th this is a good question in fact uh, uh, we have done the combining of the uh, strains in our previous nozodes for example our hiv nozode has both the strains type 1 and type 2 or hepatitis c nozode has type 1 2 genotype 1 2 3a and i think 4 uh, if i'm not mistaken similarly our e coli nozode has i think 3 or 4 strains of e coli common strains so we have put them together our mycobacterium tuberculosis nozode has four strains of uh, organisms put together so there is a way and we once we develop another nozode with covid uh, current uh, mutants we also intend to combine them and conduct some studies subsequently but but, but uh, please be informed that once we combine it becomes like a new nozode a new drug so it requires a fresh set of studies yeah but at one point we will be able to combine them and do some studies to see whether it is superior than the individual strain yes now again the same question will rise sir as you told in the case of tuberculinum uh, it was uh, developed before the uh, uh, invention of that uh, tuberculous bacteria if we do a uh, uh, multi mutant uh, uh, combination of the Uh, covid 19 or covid uh, uh, no sold 
after few more years there may be many mutations again which may, which may be undergoing it no, may no. no uh, it will not be i'll tell you why hmm. see when tuberculinum was prepared we did not have any genetic information about that but today when we develop this range of nozodes which i'm mentioning including the covid 19 nozode we have a way to do the gene sequencing and having the genetic information in place so now when we develop new uh, mutants strains so we will have all the genetic information and we'll say uh, this nozode is prepared from so and so genetic material so for example after one year some other strains come if at all for god forbid doesn't come but then that will be different than this so so it is not going to be something blinded it's going to be all distinguished uh, microbial materials sir is it possible to procure the uh, nosod from you for doing some clinical trials so uh, well when you say clinical trial you mean you want to use it on some of the people that's what you mean by clinical trial yeah maybe uh, yeah trial basically to see if, if you know even uh, uh, the parameters are right using like the inflammatory parameters or to see the activation of the uh, virus not being there or the patient getting into remission faster so uh, let us understand this is a good question many people have asked me this there is no legal way whereby i can share this nozod with you unless you decide to conduct a scientific study and whereby you request me to give you this medicine and you follow certain guidelines for conducting this study we do not have a provision in the law yet for homeopathy to develop the medicine for research purpose that is another request that we have put up with the government to have this provision there is a provision like this in allopathy or for allopathic drugs but for homeopathy we do not have such provisions so that is the job of homeopathic institutions and homeopathic pharma and such you know to raise uh, this kind of demand for what we need your question is absolutely valid doctor i would have asked the same question that your please sir like there are so many new drugs that are regularly coming into homeopathic uh, pharmacies like x ray or uh, uh, you know uh, so ozone or whatever but do they also go through all so much of uh, uh, this thing or uh, somebody just decides to make a remedy out of it does some some drug proving and it's on well do you want me to answer this question yes <laughs> <laughs> because we really, really honestly like to know well uh, x ray is an old homeopathic medicine okay <clears throat> but of course it is it is very ambiguous uh, origin no, no. how it was made was that uh, some water was exposed to x ray machine and that water was potentized how much radiation was put through the water we do not know but let us keep aside that that was a good attempt by whoever who did it at that time okay that was 100 years back right on 150 years back i have no idea but now we are talking about so called new drugs which are introduced in homeopathy like so you said ozone and you said Can you can you give two three more names so that I can give you tell you the story? Yeah, I mean, neon is also there. The names, but yeah, neon is there. Sorry, neon. What is that? That is also a drug, sir. That is made of inert gas. So, uh, see, there are uh, researchers and enthusiastic homeopaths and teachers in the world. With due respect, they introduce lot of new remedies, but none of those remedies. they undergone scientific studies so they are not formally introduced into homeopathic pharmacopoeia they are all empirically developed medicine it is it is not very different than you except for us uh, you know you prepare a medicine from the prasad from a temple near your house and potentize it and say this is prasadam 30 and uh, with all with lot of religious respect i take that but that, that is not the way how new drug discovery should happen in our unless your prasadam can be standardized if if a prasad is made from particular chemical or particular protein or particular uh, mineral or particular alkaloid which can be standardized and which undergoes the proper process then that that will be a valid drug 
see i could have done this many drugs i have developed right as you probably know i could have brought them similar to what you are mentioning but i do not want to do that i want to have a regulatory process in place in this country and that is what is my dream and once that is done once we have rules in place for new homeopathic drugs then people like you and others will also be able to introduce new drugs then you come across certain plant for example or whatever where you think okay it has a potential of developing a homeopathic drug then you can follow certain regulations certain protocol and you can try to develop a drug and get it through the regulatory process and there is the way how homeopathy will grow that's accepted sir really appreciate that uh, uh, i mean the work in that direction honestly but uh, for the sake of the pandemic is it worthwhile to sidestep that uh, commitment for a moment and make a no sowed and uh, try to give it to the population would that help do you think you uh, must, you mean somebody makes it and gives it to the patient <clears throat> patients as a preventive like uh, what you have done it, uh, with a proper uh, uh, guidelines as far as making the drugs are concerned uh, but uh, you know uh, without that commitment of really uh, making it as a uh, proper regulatory drug and doing it so so you can do that uh, as a physician you can develop a nosode like this from the sample from your patient and uh, give it to the patient and some more patients you can do that possibly i don't know what is the regulation saying about that but that is very risky because you try to do it yourself you will find it is very risky proposition you know you are exposed the material has a risk of spread so legally it you may come in trouble and uh, professionally also it is not correct what is more important than correct is to have things in place See, we have already developed the nosode now you should rather as a conscientious practitioner you should ask how do we make it available to the world yeah absolutely sir i will because right from day one like uh, uh, you all and many other associations in the country our uh, president dr sampath rao ji then and uh, our dr gopal krishna we have written to icmr and of course as you rightly said uh, we don't even uh, know whether they have read it or uh, we uh, had the mind to look through what we were asking hmm. so uh, what i would recommend is that we have some people like uh, uh, dr basne here he was there for some time i don't know he's still there dr basne sir Uh, we have Dr. Sampath Rao. We have other people. We have Jayesh Sangvi. Let all these organizations write to the ministry uh, an email within a, within within next twenty four to forty eight hours, telling them that the emergency approval proposal is there with you for last three months. Why don't we expedite this this process? This is what we should do as a conscientious. It's like it's like voting. Okay, in a democracy, you vote for it. Now is the time for the homeopathic fraternity to vote for it. And that's the way we demand in democracy. Uh, this is a good suggestion, Doctor uh, Raja Rajesh Shah. Uh, may I ask uh, any other member who is having some doubts, please? Uh, I I just have one question. Yeah, proceed. Hello? Yeah, the yes. Madam. Uh, yes. Uh, I understand. For nosod, uh, we have a particular reason to look forward to uh, for a pathological cause that we are right now addressing. So we have that question for our research purpose. But when we are looking at other homeopathic remedies, where we are saying that we want to conduct research in similar fashion and have protocols in place, but there, what would be our question? Because our medicines are generally based upon characteristics match that uh, the symptom. Matching that we look for. So, so for other medicines, uh, how do we go about? I mean, uh, what would be the research question for us? Yes. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, the same rule applies to every homeopathic medicine. And there is an area which uh, I would not like to discuss here because it's a very sensitive and gray <laughs> gray area. Many people will have to spend a lot of time to understand what I am talking about. because uh, you take any medicine for example uh, uh, there, there are medicines in homeopathy like say visbadan 
ओके और पेट्रोलियम फॉर इंस्टेंस और ग्रेफाइट्स और लेट्स टेक मेडिसिन एज सिंपल एज कैलकेरा काब नाउ वी वी प्रोसेबली दिस विल टेक मी अ मिनट और टू टू आंसर दिस क्वेश्चन लेट अस लुक एट कैलकेरा काब नाउ व्हाट डू यू थिंक इज कैलकेरा काब यू बिलीव दैट मोस्ट सम ऑफ अस बिलीव एज आई डिड बिलीव माय सेल्फ अर्लियर दैट कैलकेरा काब इज अ मेडिसिन प्रिपेयर्ड फ्रॉम कैल्शियम कार्बोनेट राइट इट इज नॉट सो केमिकल इनग्रेडियंट एंड मिनरल कॉन्टेंट एंड मेनी अदर थिंग्स इन साइड नाउ विच वन हेनीमेन हेड मेड सम टू हंड्रेड इयर्स बैक we have no idea so now if we are making a new calcara cup today in uh, in andhra so you will catch all of some oyster from the ocean and you make a, make it out of that right now that do you think it will be the same calcara cup which is which was made by hanimen will there be a difference between the two or they will be the same there will be difference mm-hmm. there will be difference But but the new cal new calcara cup made by somebody in Andhra, for example, on which indications you are prescribing? The old one. So that in the Madhya America are of the previous calcara cup, not this calcara cup. So there is a there is a going to there is a disparity. So coming back to your question, doctor, the researcher question is very good. Uh, we will have to relocate the entire Madhya America. you know in this light it is a long process but it is doable it will take us maybe 10 years if you do it very systematically but it is very much possible we need to really there's lot of clutter i'm sorry to use this word there's lot of clutter in the in the in the matter america we need to clean that and uh, yeah and that will bring a huge change excuse so, me sir yeah Uh, excuse me, sir. I am Dr. Padmaja. Uh, so I just want to ask, sir, so what uh, it is now sold when it is available in market? Is it used in a preventive method, like, or it can be used during the symptoms also, or it can it may replace that uh, Remdesivir and uh, we are giving in that place, like, so like a short drug, and uh, what will be its action to be in the market now? Uh, uh, madam i think you joined the webinar little late uh, this yeah, yes sir yes yeah exactly you can run through this uh, recording i answered all these questions uh, oh, okay is, sir thank you it is you. not it is not a substitute to a vaccine it is not a substitute to remdesivir in any case remdesivir is hardly of any use that most people know by now uh, yes. it has preventive role as well as there's a therapeutic role so potentially and of course we need to st- make more studies that i have to add Excuse me, sir. Good evening, sir. This is Dr. Vasundara. Uh, which age group? I mean, uh, who is the optimal person can be given to this uh, vaccine? No sort. I mean to say, whether immunocompromised patients also can take this vaccine? I want to know. So, in my limited uh, experience, uh, uh, we have seen it being used in children as well as uh, people with comorbidities. as well as uh, uh, immuno compromised people with severe psoriasis severe atopic dermatitis and we have seen it to be found it to be safe and it is found effective you know limited okay. small studies also. okay sir thank you sir sir one dr uh, ravinder from uh, center for cellular and molecular biology hyderabad yeah. and he is asking whether is it worthwhile to ask for an interim approval interim approval yeah interim approval yes 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 gentlemen what you said is right so we have applied uh, and requested for the approval so so there is a uh, there is a possibility by the government to give us an interim approval subject to certain conditions so we are open to that they might say that okay uh, uh, you try it out in say uh, you know 1 lakh people or 2 lakh people or 20000 people and produce the data so it is fine i think we are open to every possibility of uh, taking it to the next level
because if you don't do that uh, please understand my agony gentlemen if you don't do this and if you do not utilize the nozod being made in india during this pandemic then it is a loss of opportunity for the entire profession this loss of opportunity is not for me personally it is for the entire profession we have an unprecedented opportunity to explore homeopathy and take it to the next level take it from me and we have to make it somehow that's why sir if interim permission is yes. given yes we are very damn sure that it will be successful so yes. then government itself will come down and try to approve it in a long scale yes so uh, gentlemen you have asked for the same emergency come uh, interim uh, uh, permission you are right yeah Dr. Yeah, Sampar, please. Yeah, uh, hi, Dr. Rajesh Bhai. Ali. Yeah, Ali. Acha, is it necessary that any research or new drug researcher has to go through the CCRH to reach the MOA or uh, ICMR? Do we need to go through a source? Is it compulsory or is it necessary that CCRH has to be put in place before we move further? So, uh, for Uh, any uh, covid related related research suppose if you want to conduct a clinical trial using arsenic alb or whatever calicarbonicum for example then uh, your proposal has to go to the ministry of ayush and the ministry of ayush will send it to ccrh for a technical review so ccrh is a technical body and they review it now if you are talking about a nozod which is the new drug so again the process is similar the new drug a proposal has to go to the ministry the ministry will send it to ccrh for a technical review and after that ministry has to uh, take an approval from bcgi so now you go through this process right your pro- or because you already proved the medicine or the drug yes so now to reach the moa or to get the moa to accept it do we need to go through the ccrh once again ccrh has to recommend your drug Uh, or the no sort, or the MOA can straight away accept. So uh, MOA does not have homeopathy expertise without CCRH. There is only homeopathy expertise. So MOA has sent it to CCRH. CCRH has done the review and submitted the review report to the ministry. Now the ministry does not have, as on today, ministry does not have full powers to approve a new drug because there is there is no precedence like that. It has not happened in the past. so the ministry is also slightly confused and they are, they will take a permission from the dcgi dcgi is drug controller general of india yeah, so yeah. we have initially written to dcgi also but the dcgi does not have power, knowledge about homeopathy so dcgi is also equally confused so there is no clarity in the ministry as of now i am sorry to say that we will we will give the permission <laughs> Situation is like that. It's so catch but, catch twenty two situation, but then yes. we have to move at some level to push it. So under that situation, if you see one of my slides about Ayush notifications, so as per the notification for COVID situation, there is a provision that under these circumstances, the Ministry of Ayush may have some rights to make a quick proposal in approval. So we are trying for that approval. and that is doable because we are not very far we need some more support i'm sure something will move with the with the zest and enthusiasm with your perseverance and show it go to some to and we'll also find out more yes so i think is uh, ghf uh, uh, ghf should write to the ministry immediately in my uh, humble request and opinion that this must be taken up to the next level because without we all we do not have a lobby let us understand in the, in the conventional medicine allopathy there is a strong lobby for everything oh. that's why they get their work done here there is no lobby <coughs> so we need sir to- a simple a small suggestion sir uh, there are approximately 2 and 1/2 lakhs homeopaths in uh, all over india i just request you to prepare a format Uh, so that it can be distributed in all the groups of homeopath every homeopath has uh, some 10 or 15 groups in his uh, phone you just make a format and what to be written and how to be uh, and to whom to be forwarded so that uh, at least few people will respond to that 
not a few we can make many people respond to that because a simple effort will go a long way in our uh, success yeah so i request you to do that sir because just a simple format what to be written and to whom to be written under their signature by like emails or letters or anything which are is possible right so yes. you just think over this sir yeah yeah that is that is a good suggestion of course uh, we are meanwhile talking to various institutions as i said the institutions if they write that will also have better impact but individuals right. can also write So I think we have questions, uh, please. So it seems, uh, uh, yeah. With that, I think uh, we come to uh, a conclusion and we come to an end, and uh, uh, we'll keep in touch, uh, you know, on the development. And uh, thank you very much once again, the, all the organizers. I not give everybody's name, but all the organizers who invited me. for this uh, talk at uh, homeopathy medical association of telangana and uh, all the participants who have shown interest i am happy to see that certain questions were asked which we never asked in the past and uh, we must keep asking more and more questions about each and every homeopathic drug that's the way to grow thank you so much uh, thank you dr jesh uh, sorry dr rajesh shah for uh, your elaborating this presentation and you elaborated what is uh, dsl 2 3 and uh, homeopathic pharmacopoeia of india then animal toxicity study then what is phase 1 what is phase 2 study and uh, how uh, what what is the immunological effect of uh, uh, this medicine uh, in producing the interleukins the cd4 count in increasing and uh, the comparative study with uh, arsenical bryonia camphor and uh, the covid-19 vaccine so and uh, let us wish and let us hope uh, uh, this will take uh, uh, to the next level so uh, let us uh, may put our effort also so to take uh, uh, homeopathy to the next level by introducing this uh, uh, vaccine medicine so thank you dr jayesh uh, dr rajesh uh, dr venugopal gauri please uh, carry on the uh, next phase of action i request uh, our president to dr, dr. gopal krishna sir to say a few words yeah am i audible very much sir yeah i congratulate dr shah for his excellent talk and many details he has given and we are really happy to hear all that we are more knowledgeable with his we have gained lot of information from his knowledgeable talk and i from my side and on behalf of our association would request him to carry out drug You are not audible, Doctor Krishna. Please unmute yourself. As we are using tuberculinum, influenzinum, dexterinum, hydrophobinum, many not just for that particular illness to be prevented, for other purposes also we are using. so similarly i request dr rajesh shah to explore and work on carrying out drug proving and make it a very efficient tool in the armamentarium of our homeopathic matter medica i thank you once again thank you thank you dr gopal krishna sir i request uh, dr anand rao mengji uh, to uh, give vote of thanks Yeah, at the outset, uh, I thank the speaker, today's speaker, the most eminent doctor, Dr. Rajesh Shah, a teacher, clinician, a hardcore researcher, and promoter of homeopathy. He has excellently spoken on this today's topic, COVID-19, 
and he has very decently uh, explained about the uh, about the scientific approach to the research and how the government uh, has to approve it and the drug about drug proving and the animal trials and the human trial so i thank him very profusely for his excellent speech i also thank the uh, office bearers of homeopathic medical association of telangana the president dr gopal krishna garu the secretary dr durga prasad garu the treasurer dr venu gopal garu the convener of uh, webinar series dr sampatra garu and uh, our uh, advisor dr shivashankar garu who have been very uh, uh, behind this uh, covid because in the last uh, week only we had a series of discussion regarding this covid so all the homeopaths around the uh, world are uh, uh, behind this covid to find some solution and uh, we congratulate and uh, support dr rajesh for his uh, efforts to bring some positivity in his research work so i also thank all the participants in this today's webinar and uh, uh, who have involved in the discussions and ask many questions and uh, regarding this covid so i thank one and all and uh, i give the mic to dr vain thank you so much sir thank you so much uh, thank you all meet soon and update you about uh, dr rajesh ji's achievements in this direction and also in about the next webinars to come thank you one and all Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.